Well, thank you very much uh, for being here today. I think the most important thing is, uh, is trying to you know, bring you expertise um, like the panel that we have that will talk about empowerment, that will talk about the courage and the commitment that has been made you know, uh, by them, and more important is the courage that they had to do what they do best. And uh, I'm just very proud that they have done great work in our communities. Um, uh, in some cases, you know, we have uh, a, 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 an ambassador here, which is uh, amazing, amazing. Uh, but more important, um, I'm going to let you, I'm going to start off with uh, Leticia Velez. She is the president and CEO of Chicago Minibus Travel. She is awesome. I, I mean, she, I know her. She is just um, a little dynamite, just like me. <laughs> but more important, she is just someone who gives back. I've seen her working out there, hiring people in our communities, but more important, she had a vision, and she, uh, that vision became a reality, and today, you know, she's got a very successful uh, mini, minivan, minibus uh, 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 fleet, I call it the fleet. Uh, when you see that out there, I am always very proud because I know the woman behind that vision. So I want to introduce, uh, first and foremost, Leticia Velez, uh, President and CEO of Chicago Minibus Travels. A little shorter. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, uh, Senator Iris Martinez. Um, it is such an honor to be here and to see the Latino community just growing and being so involved and finding ways to collaborate at how we can um, partner up and be successful and be that change that's needed, especially for the Latino community. And as well as making our mark to make sure that we're being noticed, not just with our numbers growing nationally, but making sure that the careers that we decide to select, uh, what we can do to share things forward, um, how we're sticking out in schools. You know, we are the future, and we got to make sure we get all the critical tools we need to um, be successful and show that Latinos have the power and the influence that is, um, you know, basically the way we were raised is who we should be. We can't forget the good traits of uh, respecting each other, loving each other, but at the same time being great leaders. Um, I have a bus company that is actually, it's interesting, across the street. It's uh, on the west side of the highway, and we're going on 10 years in business next year. I am, um, I think I'm still currently the only Latina in Chicago to own a bus company. So I am in that male industry, so at times it can be challenging. But um, I'm one of those that uh, will not go away. So as bad as they may want me to you know, kind of disappear, I love what I do. And actually what I do is just uh, helping people out, servicing people and being there for them and um, being an extension of their teams. Um, but besides that, one of the things that I learned is that um, my dad, I'm Puerto Rican, my dad was the chief of the tribe. And Papi said this is the way things were, that's the way it was. And I was the baby of four. And then my mom stayed home to raise us, and mommy pushed on education and, and achieving anything you want. Papi taught us about work ethic and being the provider for the family. He didn't picture that his smallest, youngest, and I kind of joke about this, little baby black sheep in the family would be a provider. But that's who I am. So having a business uh, makes me responsible for about 35 employees and their families. So I take that very serious and very personal to make sure whatever, whatever challenges are going on, that I take care of my team and I make sure that I'm there for them as much as I can be. And when necessary, when the economy was hard, I actually made myself the sacrificial lamb to make sure that they were taken care of first. Um, so that's really important for me. And it's important that I um, take care of them the way Papi took care of us. So that's my story. But this isn't about me. This is about um, everybody that's here on the panel. And I'd like to introduce a few different people. And I do have some questions for them. But uh, they're going to talk a little bit about themselves. And I want to hear about their leadership, their leadership tools, how they empower people, what's the courage. And then later we will take some questions uh, from the audience, OK? So we have Maria Wynn, who is the CEO of Girl Scouts of Greater Chicago and Northwest Indiana, which is the largest um, Girl Scout console in the world. And Maria, if you'd like to talk about yourself, you know, I'd love to hear a few things um, about yourself and what you've done to be that trailblazer and be that powerful Latina that we need out there. Uh, the next one right after Maria 
is um, Ambassador Carmen Lomelin. 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 Sorry about that. Um, how incredible to have a female ambassador, Latina, in Washington to be that impact that we need. And then we also have uh, Jesse Ruiz, who is a partner of Drinker, Drinker, Biddle, and Wreath, where he is a member of the firm's Corporate and Securities Group and Client Service Committee, and also serves as the firm's marketing partner. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you. And let me just add that he is the Latino Caucus Foundation. I, I always admire him because, you know, it's always pro bono. We love pro bono. <laughs> oh, yes. He's been the pro bono for 11 years, and we love him for it. <laughs> How much Maria, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? In the context of leadership, right? Yes. Okay. So, um, you know, you heard, some of you heard me speak this morning. Um, I was raised in Colombia, in Bogota, Colombia, and I think um, early on I was allowed to take on leadership roles. Um, whether it was at school or whether it was, um, you know, I was not a Girl Scout, but I was able to be a Cub Scout because my brother was a Cub Scout. So I was able to be the Den Mother's assistant when I was about maybe 10 or 11, which gave me a taste of leadership as well. Um, and I, I think the important thing about the journey that I've had in leadership is that um, early on, um, as I uh, was in school, I went to a school that was run by an order, order of Franciscan nuns from Minnesota. The values that my parents taught me, the values that I learned in school, became part of who I am as a person and the uncompromising part of my leadership. I think um, as we rise in leadership and as we take on leadership roles, one of the things to um, always uh, work on is who are you at the center and who do you want to be as a leader? And I think that's really important. Your signature as a leader is something that you will develop over time or that you'll feel comfortable with. It has to be genuine. It has to be authentic. Um, and I had the great opportunity in my, in my life to be able to create a whole career in technology. Um, I worked for Xerox, I worked for Microsoft, I worked for Ameritech, and I was not a technologist, I was an art major. Um, so I think part of, part of what um, has helped me in my life is to be able to be open to new opportunities and, new, and to new things. So to be able to have a career in technology after having been a a, uh, an art major was kind of a surprising thing, but I was a sales and marketing leader. Um, I'm, I am a marketer. And um, in looking at leadership and marketing, I think the secret, the trademark, is to make sure that you're always looking at the world through your customer's eyes. It's not what you want to do, it's what the customer needs, it's what the customer really um, um, is going to center their, their motivation in. So when it comes to leadership, you have to take your own leadership. You also have to look at what you are expected to do in your job and translate that, but never ever forget who it is that is your audience. And it doesn't matter if it's a customer, a client, a constituent, um, a girl. It's always about looking through the eyes of that person that you're serving and using your leadership to ensure that, that you're doing the right thing for them and by them. And, um, as I look at the, the responsibility that I have today, the responsibility is all centered on the future of girls. And uh, part of the leadership um, mark that I, that I leave is an ability to um, really look ahead into the future. So I've aligned, I've helped our organization to align all of our programming in the year 2040. Why? Because our five-year-old will be in her 30s, our um, teenager will be in her 40s, and we need to prepare them for that world that I spoke about today, which is that world of science, of technology, of engineering, of math, and of careers that we can't even imagine. Um, and at the same time, building girls that are going to have the courage, the confidence, and the character to be the leaders in their communities and in their life as they become influential in the 21st century. Thank you, thank you, Maria. That was wonderful, and we're so, we're so happy to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, we're going to be hearing from Carmen next. Do you mind if I stand? No, please do. I like connecting with folks. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, good morning. Um, I like that. I'm absolutely delighted to be here and, and to, uh, to those uh, that are participating in putting this, this event together. This is really important. You know, when uh, people invite you to speak at a conference, it's always a thrill. 
but when they know you and they still invite you, it doesn't get much better than that. Um, I'm going to uh, just uh, lay out a few po uh, points on, first of all, a little bit about my background and how I got to here uh, to the position that I currently hold. And also a, a few of the lessons that I've learned along the way. This is part of a broader presentation that I do to, to, young, to young people, to students. That's one of my passions is letting people know uh, uh, the importance of education and the incredible opportunities of, that, are, that exist in the, in the international arena. Um, you can hear a lot of us that are a little of a certain age talk about John Kennedy. And one of the things he said that our purpose as a nation cannot be swifter than our progress in education. In my case, like many of you, um, I should have been a statistic. I grew up in a steel town, northwest Indiana, you know, uh, 40 minutes from here. Um, my first job out of high school was a steel mills. When we, were, when we were in school, we were told that our sole responsibility was to go to school and do well. Heaven forbid you show up to my house with a C on the report card. Um, and this made all the difference in the world for me. Now, I wanted to go to college, but like many of you, we didn't have the resources. I was the oldest of five. I had to work. My first job was in the mills, working the midnight shift, which I did for, for the first seven years that I worked. I didn't know about student loans and scholarships and uh, opportunities for funding for school because nobody told me. I had a school counselor actually tell me, gee, you might want to consider majoring in home ec. What the heck is that? <laughs> um, so it took me a little longer. It took me 14 years to get both of my degrees. Uh, undergrad, I went to St. Joe's College in Whiting, Indiana. Uh, graduate school, got my MBA from DePaul University. But I think one thing, and this is one of the lessons that, I, that I've learned, is what you may consider a, fet, a setback. Ay Dios, que voy a hacer, no puedo, no tengo. That is actually an opportunity for, to learn and to grow. What I learned, patience, the art of goal setting, responsibility and maturity, because you know what? It was on me and no one, I had no one um, else to blame uh, but myself if it didn't work. I was working in the steel mills. I eventually ended up in, in the sales department. And, and please yank me when, I, when I'm <laughs> going over my time. And I thought I was going to be in corporate. I mean, that's what one did. Um, and I had, I overheard my boss telling another supervisor, Carmen, I don't worry about it. We don't have to promote her. All you have to do is give her a periodic raise. She'll be fine. I had already received an, a Latina with an MBA in 1984? Come on. After I got over being hurt, I got really angry, for, for want of a better word, and I decided to leave. And an opportunity presented itself to me to work for MALDEF, Mexican American Legal Defense. And that is one of the major aha moments of my life because I, full force, was thrown into our community issues. Yeah, I knew about them up here. But to actually see what was going on in our communities was heartbreaking. Um, and it, it really got me to, to working. And I, I figured out after a while that, you know what? You can't really create change unless you've got people working on the inside to, to create that change. We've got to be at those tables, the, whether it's the policy table, the boards of directors, when decisions are being made that impact our communities. Um, so I got involved in politics. Eventually went to work for uh, the city of Chicago, and there's a whole other story about uh, some of the political work that I've done. Um, but I've, I had some incredible opportunities. Had an opportunity which was one of like, oh my God, what did I do? In retrospect, I was working for an organization called Chicago United. And there used to be this skinny black kid from the south side that used to hang out at our offices because he used to uh, work on school reform. If you would have told me then, that he was going to be the president of the United States, I probably would have paid a little more attention to him, you know? <laughs> the same thing happened when I was asked to give a contribution to his political campaign. He was running for Senate. I was already uh, supporting someone else. And um, my friend called me up, and she said, oh, this guy's running for Senate, U.S. Senate in Illinois. I said, who? I said, Barack Obama. The skinny black kid from the south side of Chicago? Get out of here. Say no more. But um, I think you have to look, take these uh, opportunities because that's what they are and learn from them. Um, one of the things I always advise young people is to not only focus on education, but focus on lifelong learning. 
make a promise to yourself that what you know that today, you're going to know something you didn't know yesterday. Whether it's some trivia or, or something, but to keep your mind active. Develop an expertise. Become an expert at something, whatever it is that, that, that drives you, you know, whatever, whatever it is that, that is your passion, become an expert at it. Someday, Jesse's going to need somebody who, who has an expertise in women's issues. Right, Jesse? <laughs> <laughs> they pay very well. Mm -hmm. Or immigration, or the arts, or how to start a business or how to become a chef, whatever it is that, that, that moves you, become an expert at it. To, and to the young people here, learn to identify mentors. Don't be ashamed and afraid to say, can I pick your brain? Ah, me da pena, ah, no, no, I can't, no, no, no get rid of it, forget, forget about it. People are flattered when you ask them for their opinion. Don't ask them for a job, first you ask for the opinion, you pick their brains, <laughs> then you ask them for a job. Um, and I think one of the other main lists, because I know I have, I have to uh, sit down, um, quit blaming the past. Get over it. I'll close with a, a, a statement, another statement by John Kennedy. Let us not fix the blame for the past. Let us accept our own responsibility for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. That was wonderful. It sounds like we shouldn't be our own barrier. Right, because right? sometimes, you know what, we keep coming up with excuses, oh, why we can't do one thing or another, but I think that sometimes we are our own barriers, so we have to kind of just put that aside and just go forward, because I know by my life experience, you can do anything. <laughs> okay, Jesse, you're next. I'm up. Uh, <laughs> I think I need the women's uh, issues expert right now, actually. <laughs> you're sitting next to me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, actually, I, I, I'm the youngest of four. I have three older sisters, so uh, I, I've been dealing uh, with women's issues my entire life. I <laughs> and, uh, and unfortunately, or for better or worse, they've had to deal with a little brother that was me. Um, but in any event, um, thank you all. It, it's a little humbling to be on a panel entitled Leadership and Empowerment. Frankly, when I'm looking across the room and I see uh, folks who are, you know, most of you are leaders. Uh, in your respective communities, lives, professions. Um, I look out at Virginia Martinez, who is one of the first Latina lawyers uh, in Illinois, um, and you know, paved the way for Latino lawyers like me. I, I, see, I see over and I see Blanca Vargas, and, and I got to college. I got to college on a LULAC scholarship. Uh, that, that, and in fact, I, di I didn't realize that uh, I was listening to NPR yesterday morning, and um, I was thinking of you, Blanca, and I was thinking about that scholarship because do you know the last dinner that President Kennedy had, where he had it with? LULAC. He went, it was the first President of the United States who went and, and, uh, and actively engaged the Latino community the night before, on November 21st, 1963, his last dinner was at a LULAC dinner in Texas. Uh, and uh, where the first lady spoke, first time, first lady spoke, she had done a commercial in Spanish. Uh, the very first uh, political ad in Spanish was Jackie Kennedy, who learned not so good Spanish, but she, you know, si hizo es entender, as my parents would say. Uh, and uh, she did a commercial and she spoke Spanish and addressed the crowd that evening. Um, so I think of these organizations and thinks of these folks, and that's when I think of leadership, I think of the examples I've had in my life. And uh, I, I tend to believe that leadership somewhat is innate, but somewhat is, uh, is made. As we like to say in our firm, you know, law firm partners aren't born, we make them. Uh, and so it's up to us as a community to make our leaders. And uh, they in turn have to acknowledge that they were made and uh, pay it forward and, and, and uh, acknowledge it as well. And so I try to do that and look at the examples that I've had. I mean, it starts with my parents. So I grew up on the far south side of Chicago in the Roseland community uh, where my mother still lives in her 50th year on the same street on 116th Street in Roseland. Uh, very different community today than the, the community, they, speaking of 1963, that they moved in the summer of 1963. 
which is largely an Italian immigrant community. Now it's an African American community. Um, and, uh, you know, my dad was a bracero. He came here to pick crops from Irapuato, Guanajuato, Mexico in uh, 1943 and picked crops from 43 to 47 all over the United States until he landed in, in Chicago and uh, um, then picked crops in Mendota, Illinois for a while before he basically jumped ship and was undocumented for, for um, eight years until in 55 he went back to fix his papers and met my mom in Irapuato and brought her back, uh, both then with, with legal status. Um, and so I think of them, guy with a third grade education, um, and uh, I think of my mom, thank God, who's still with me, there, um, and she graduated high school and she was a straight A student. She proudly always shows me her report cards from La Academia, uh, uh, where she went to school, and straight A's always. And um, again, there was the, their model was servant leadership through their words, so, you know, my parents were not from, the, from here. They didn't know about Cub Scouts. They didn't know about Girl Scouts. They didn't know about Little League, yet they were always there volunteering, you know. <laughs> my dad always worked on Sundays in a bakery at 57th and LaSalle uh, all his life. So he didn't go to church on Sundays, and, but when he was retired, uh, he was there every Sunday. He was the usher, he was involved in everything. And so servant leadership is a model I look at from them, humble people, but they saw a job that needed to be done and they did it. There was no job too big or too small that they wouldn't tackle. Um, the other model that I like to, to see is when you see something that needs to be done, you, you do it. Um, you know, there's issues in our community. Um, Carmen's quote is very appropriate and what I, I saw is education is something that's gonna be the key path for us to get forward as a community. It's been the key path for every immigrant community in this nation. And so when I saw that, um, I thought this is one area I'd like to volunteer some time in. And so for the past nine years, I've served on school boards and tried to do that. So trying to be an impact player on life. They talk about being an impact player in sports. I try to be an impact player in my life. You know, how do I make a difference? Um, you know, I just lost my dad earlier this year. He was 96 years old. And so it was kind of a time of reflection. I kind of thought he was going to be around forever. He was a really healthy guy up until the last year of his life, uh, still shoveling snow when he was 95 and complaining about his back hurting. And I'm thinking, my back would hurt if I shoveled the snow you, you'd shoveled. Uh, but you know, it makes you reflect on what, what you know, when you're summing up your life, what will you have accomplished? What will you have touched? And you know, that last moment of his life with his family around him. Uh, hopefully he was very proud of what he left here in the form of his kids, his grandkids and great grandkids. So what are we gonna do? Um, and then lastly, you, you've gotta be pragmatic as well. And so you've gotta uh, obtain, there was a boss that I had in the steel industry. In fact, I think Carmen and I worked at the same steel company. Uh, I was there a little diff different later time, uh, but um, Steve Bowser. Steve Bowser would always tell me uh, when he'd put us on, on work teams, we were re redesigning a different part of the company, Ryerson Steel at the time, and, and, and we had to totally reinvent the company. It was hemorrhaging cash like crazy. And we were put on work teams, and, he, and he's like, Jesse, and, he, and we were having a side conversation. He's like, what are you gonna tell me so I can predict whether or not you're gonna be successful at what you're doing? And I'm like, I don't know what do you mean, what are you gonna tell me? And, and he's like, what's the first thing you need that you can't proceed without uh, whether I know you're going to be successful at transforming this company or not. And uh, I still wasn't following him. He's like, you need buy-in. You know, you need, you know, you need buy-in. You can't lead if folks aren't following. And so you got to make sure that you don't think that you are smarter than everybody else, that you haven't taken the time to get the buy-in. You're not always going to get unanimity, as I've learned on school boards, but you need a, a critical mass of buy-in. So make sure you get that buy-in. And, and it kind of also then corresponds to what uh, the senator and representative, I'm sure, learn in Springfield every day, coalition building, mm -hmm. that you need to, to get that critical mass, sometimes outside of your own circle and have other circles that uh, you, find, you, find, you form your Venn diagrams of these circles that, that touch. I mean, if they overlap, it's great, but as long as they touch, that's good. Uh, and then lastly, um, uh, a client, uh, a client of mine who always told me, Jesse, you're a great lawyer and you work very hard for us, but don't ever get complacent and never, ever, ever mistake effort and hard work with results. It's like we pay you for results. And I think leaders have to focus on the fact that we can work very hard, but if we don't deliver results, 
you're not really deemed a very effective leader. And so um, we can't get too caught up in the work and the effort and mistake that for results. You've got to produce results. And so that's something I try to, especially when those folks who are paying me by the hour and obscene amount of money, uh, you know, you've got to, not the caucus, of course. Uh, <laughs> that's pro bono. Uh, but, uh, uh, and the foundation. Happy to do it. Um, but you need those paying clients to balance it out. And so for them, that they, it's critical that I never, ever just keep working hard and not lose sight of their goals, uh, which have to be my goals, and produce those results that they're looking for. So those are some of the themes that I can think of throughout my life that have kind of helped um, in terms of how I define and enact leadership in my life. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. You are the best attorney, I just have to say. <laughs> I won't argue with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been working with you for many years already, so it's a great experience. 11, and but who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have some questions. So, so we're, we're done with the panelists. No, we're not done with the panelists, because we have some questions that, were, that we took from the audience. So uh, I have a list of questions. I'll start with Jesse. <laughs> Happy to. Jesse. Maybe you've already uh, mentioned this in the past, but I was making some interview, uh, doing some interviews, so uh, I was a little late. So sorry. And um, so the first question is, who is your role model and why? Who's my role model? Um, my parents. You know, I, I have to go back to them. That thank God, um, again, incredibly. You know, I still I still miss them dearly, but um, you know, my dad and my mom, and it was a good balance. My dad was a, a, a very stubborn, incredibly hardworking man. Um, and, and again, you know, he saw a job that needed to be done. Uh, he saw trash down the street that needed to be picked up. It doesn't matter that it was not his job to do it. It didn't matter that it wasn't in front of his house. He did it. Um, you know, he saw something that needed to make the neighborhood's life better. He did it. The man could speak to anybody and would speak to anybody, and he would talk to your ear off uh, if you would let him. <laughs> that I remember at his funeral, at his funeral, you know, the little gangbangers from the neighborhood, they came, and, and they were all like hugging on me. I'm like, who are these people? Like, <laughs> uh, the old ladies, some of the old Italian ladies were still in. I'm like, he is the most diverse group of, and I realized like, my dad, he was retired. When you get to be 96, you get to be retired for 30 years of your life. So he spent those 30 years walking around the neighborhood talking to everybody. I mean, uh, and, you know, young and old, and he'd, you know, grab the gangbangers and tell them, quit, you know, get your life on track. And, and he could get away with it. He was in the 90s, and he'd tell them what he thought. <laughs> uh, and so, um, you know, it, it taught me that you got to reach out. You know, you've got to work hard. Um, You've you got to be humble. And, uh, and then my mom, you, you know, you've got to be, you got to do your homework. And you've got to be, uh, and as you said, an expert in something. Uh, and so excel at what you do and, uh, and put it to good work in areas outside of what you do. I mean, I'm a middle market mergers and acquisitions lawyer. Um, I'd never formed a nonprofit. I didn't tell these guys. I'm like, I have no <laughs> idea what I'm doing for you guys. But uh, through there, allowing me to work with them and for them, I know nonprofit law pretty well now. Uh, as I incorporated them and got them their 501c3 status 11 years ago. And now I've done it for a variety of nonprofits. Uh, so I took my corporate legal knowledge, mainly done for you know, Fortune 500 corporations, and applied it to the nonprofit world um, and to help on some endeavors that I thought what they were going to embark on 11 years ago uh, was going to be very good for our community. It was my way of contributing to that effort. So, Thank you for getting back to the community. And, and you know what, I love hearing the story about, you know, your dad's funeral, because I was there and it was beautiful, it was so moving. When you're we're speaking about it, it, I got the chills from my toes to my head. But thank you for having me, and thank you for your friendship. Um, next. <laughs> okay, I, my next question will be to Maria. Okay, what makes you a successful leader, Maria? Um, you know, I talked about genuine leadership. You know, I talked about um, really developing your own leadership style and understanding who you are as a leader. And I think there's a lot of work that has to be done inside of that. That doesn't happen by accident. And some of it is really hard work. Um, when I was at Xerox and um, was fortunate enough to have been um, identified as a high potential candidate, I had the opportunity as a vice president to um, go to the Center for Creative Leadership. 
um, for a class mm -hmm. that was called Leadership at the, at the Peak. Leadership at the Peak mm -hmm. was uh, five days where you were torn apart and put back together. Uh, the first day of class, no kidding, at six o'clock in the morning, they drew blood. So it was about um, looking at leadership in, in, uh, under four different lenses. One of them was physically, how should you be as a leader? How should you care for yourself to be the best in your performance? Spiritually, what does that mean to you as a leader? It took on family and certainly you know, the skill sets of, um, of whatever area of expertise you had. But um, what it helped me to do was to really take a hard look at myself and uh, there were lots of psychological instruments they used and all kinds of stuff that where they provided you feedback. There was 360 analysis of you know, the people that worked with you, above you, below you, all around you. Um, and I think to really be a good leader, you have to face yourself as you are. And some of what you're gonna see is not necessarily pretty, but being aware of it will make you better. And taking the hard journey into that introspection, I think is really important to become a good leader. So part of what I think has made me successful as a leader is looking at the things that I'm not very good at and knowing what those are or the pieces of my personality that are not necessarily as likable as I would like them to be. And then leveraging the ones that are strengths and um, always being um, focused on the people that are around me and that have to work with me and do the job with me. Um, because without them, the job doesn't get done or the endeavor doesn't get accomplished. So um, humility is important. Um, I think that's an extraordinary gift for a leader. Um, you don't have to be first. Uh, when I built our new Girl Scout offices, my office is the smallest in all of the offices and I wanted it to be that way because I didn't want girls to come to our offices and think that being a leader is all about having a big corner office. It's not about that. It's not about the trappings of power. It is about who you are. It is about caring about what you're doing. And it is about having the courage to lead through really tough times. And that's, I think, part of the trademark that I also have is I, I won't shy away from tough decisions that have to be made. But somebody's got to make them, right? <laughs> but you have to make them with humanity. And you have to make them with an understanding that they will be, in the long run, the best things for the business or for whatever endeavor you're leading. Thank you. Carmen, um, are you a mentor or a mentee to have uh, you have, or have you ever been? What was the value that was received and given? I have always, I have all these young people that I, I call them my kids. Um, I'm always mentoring young people. I think it's important um, because, especially in the world that I inhabit you really need a lot of help in, in knowing how to maneuver not only on what you see, but what you, sorry, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, that's my family. Um, uh, but um, it wasn't until I, I got to Washington that, that I, pers I mentioned in my, in my presentation, identify a mentor, that, that I did identify a mentor, and it was the head of the agency where I first worked at in Washington. And he gave me the ability to go work at the White House twice. Um, and to learn Washington without being in the hot seat of Washington, and it was an incredible experience, and I've never forgotten that. So I reach out to young people, uh, interns. I will never deny a request for a meeting with a young person or a phone call with a young person because um, that is just so important to have someone, someone listen to you. Um, so yeah, th this is part of what I do on a regular basis. Uh, I mentioned when I was talking that you know I talk to people about the you know the amazing opportunities of, in international. That's that's what I, I try to get kids into the State Department. One of my heartbreaks is that I look around and the numbers of Latino kids is so low. And you get what we've heard for so many years. I, I, I think of Virginia and, and Blanca and others. Oh, we can't find qualified Latinos for the Foreign Service of the United States. I said, oh, you just don't know where to look. I'll give you a whole list. <laughs> um, and so I, I make an effort to bring in uh, Latino interns into my office and to work with them and to you just ha help them learn their ropes. That, to me, is, for any leader, that is part of what a major job responsibility, and you should never forget that. And again, and on the flip side, and I mentioned that too when I was talking to the young people, que no les de pena. 
I didn't, I wasn't born into this position. Actually, I just shared, if you would have told me 25 years ago that I was going to be a U.S. ambassador, I would have asked you what you were smoking. <laughs> so I, I, I was there where I had no clue about things. So no les de pena preguntar, pedir, you know, ask for advice, ask for guidance. I think everybody here on this panel would, would agree that they would be more than happy to, to do so. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you. Um, Leticia? Uh, your question will be, give us one key of success that someone can use in their tool uh, kit. Um, right before As a businesswoman. That, can I give my G, uh, JFK quote? Oh, please do. Please do. <laughs> um, I didn't want to pick one, so I picked two. And I know some people may kind of look at the second one as interesting. But So the first one that I selected was, uh, only those who dare to fail greatly can ever achieve greatly. It's a really, really good one. The second one is forgive your enemies, but never forget their names. <laughs> <laughs> um, I forgot the question. Oh, toolkit? <laughs> yes, toolkit. Um, you know, uh, here's a, a tool and I think a takeaway that I think you can use in your toolbox. You know, over the years, when I got into transportation, became an entrepreneur, I didn't know what I was doing or what was happening. I just kind of jumped in, right, head first. I'm always one of those that I fly first and then I figure out where I'm going to land or how. And um, I started, um, I love watching people. I don't know about you guys, but I love people watching. So if I can learn from someone and I can get a tool from someone, um, what they're doing, best practices, I don't care what the, the, the color of their skin is, the nationality, anything. It's like, how can I learn to be a better me? And years ago, I started building relationships with large corporations and government to help me be better and do a better job um, as a leader. And one of the things that I figured out, I remember in 2009, it was like the light bulb turned on in my head, and it was basically saying, go build relationships, okay? Because see, like someone said earlier, don't go hard sell. You have to build a relationship first. They get to know you and see the value in you, if there's a value, which you wanna have a value. Um, and then if they can't use you for something, whether it's a referral on a job or if you have a business and they do business with you, maybe they know somebody that can. And you know that's gonna be really criti critically important for your growth and your success. Because one thing that I learned is as you build relationships, these people will be, once you build a true relationship, they'll be your partners, they'll be your soldiers out there, They're, they'll be a part of your voice. And you, you never know who you're meeting. Um, I was in a program with Walmart called America's Leaders of Change. And one of the things that I heard that was really hard for me, and I don't know who knows an audience, but I was abused in both my marriages, so it was very hard. But the first day that they told us, they said, you have to own your greatness. And I was like, oh my God, like literally after everything I've heard over the years, how could I own what I've told I'm not? But you know what? Um, that was someone else's words. That's not who I am. I am who I am. I mean, I was talking about how most of us up here are wearing red, and someone said, oh yeah, that's that power color red. I love red. <laughs> um, but you know what? I'm different. And I'm gonna be as good as I wanna be, and as much as I put in is what I'm gonna get out. So I'll tell you guys, whatever you want, go get it, but what you put in is what you're gonna get out, and don't ask anybody to give it, get it for you. So toolkit, go out there, build relationships, and watch your toolbox is gonna fill up quick. Design your own destiny. That's right. Well, thank you. Uh, now I'm going to uh, open it up to the audience. Anyone that wants to line up and you have some questions, we'll take a few questions because we'll be um, ending this workshop at 10:45. But I have, we're going to have to at least. Okay, let's say about 25 minutes. Can you cut it off? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to give five people five minutes each. If you know, so if you want to come up and you have a question, please step up. Because the last five minutes that we have, I'll go like this. Here. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I have. A, I want to do some closing okay, state, statements. Okay. Questions? Please step up. Don't be shy. <laughs> okay. Right there. That's perfect. I think you can be loud. You can be right. Okay. Louder. Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> that 
one. No, I mean, I think we are, you know, an amalgam of all of our life experiences, and, and those things definitely impact you on, on who you become. And, um, you know, I've worked in the steel industry. I've been a management consultant. I'm an attorney now. I've served on school boards. So all those experiences shape who I am and how I approach everything I do. Um, the one thing, and, and, and frankly, I didn't, I wouldn't go around saying this until a couple of years ago. You know, I flunked out of college my first year. You know, I went down to the University of Illinois. I was an electrical engineering major. I was having a lot of fun, uh, <laughs> but I wasn't, I wasn't getting the straight A's I was used to getting in high school. Uh, it was a different ball game. It was a di I remember my calculus class, the, the professor for some reason asked, how many valedictorians in the room, uh, are in the room, everybody but me raised their hand. So it was a different level of competition that I didn't step up to. I think I could have, but I didn't. Uh, and, and I literally had to beg my way in, back into the University of Illinois. That I, literally, I sat in the dean's office for eight straight hours and waited. He never made a decision on that Monday. And I remember I went back, I think Tuesday afternoon, after I sat in a chair outside the man, and I think he was just trying to get rid of me. He was like, finally, I'd readmit this kid. Uh, and I would go to pray at St. John's Church in between uh, <laughs> and, you know, put up a uh, light of vela and tell my mom that she was praying for me too and all that. So I went back, and then I... Then I taking advantage of opportunities and perseverance, that we're all gonna fall down somewhere in our lives at all points of our careers, but you gotta persevere and you gotta learn how to persevere. For students nowadays, they're talking about resilience and having resilience, and those students who are more resilient will be more successful in life. And so, yeah, those lessons, I've never let an opportunity pass me by again. Uh, I've never failed to reach out to get help when I needed it again. Uh, and I've persevered through tough times in my life and in my career, and I'll always do that. But that's a res result of that experience my freshman year. Where, you know, I don't, I don't advise learning those lessons that way, but uh, it, it was something that I had to go back and do over again. I don't know if I'd do it over again, differently. Can I jump in? Yeah. Um, I, uh, we were low income, so I couldn't, we didn't have money for me to go to college. And so until last year, I won a scholarship with Goldman Sachs for the 10,000 Small Business Program. And I went to college for like three months. And I remember that morning, I told my son, who was 19 at the time, I said, oh, Antonio, I'm going to school. I had my apple ready for the teacher. I said, take my picture. I'm really excited. <laughs> and he's like, Mom, you know, calm down. You're just going to school. Um, and um, I was so excited. And some stuff, I'll be honest, you know, some stuff I couldn't like grasp. It was like over my head. But for everything, I just sat there, and I just wanted to be a sponge and learn. And I'll tell you, I wish that I could have gone to school earlier because it helped me with my business so much. We grew 60% last year in business, but we also had uh, unhealthy growth. So there was successful and there was unhealthy, and people don't think about that. They always think, oh, you're growing, that's great. Well, but you don't know what we went through. You know, what were the struggles and the pains? And this year was a different mentality with the growth. And I'm really happy that I went to school, and, and I think those are opportunities, but it was something free that I got you know, from a corporation. Just like with all the opportunities with LULEC and all these different organizations. If you can learn, just jump on any opportunities that are out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Any other questions from the audience? Please step up. Hi, I'm Linda Liang from the Chicago School. Thank you so much. Um, I work with women of color in STEM disciplines postdocs on an NSF grant. And one of, you've hinted at owning your power and owning your strengths and what you can do. And I see women struggle with that all the time. Even though they're brilliant, they're smart, they're capable, they just don't quite own it. Do any of you have some suggestions for helping me with that? Thank you. Business? I, I can jump that again. <laughs> um, you know, I did something interesting, um, and again, it goes back to 2009. You know, um, you know, I hate to say it, but I'm going to share. I didn't do a lot in the Latino community till 2008, late 2008, when I met the Illinois Hispanic Chamber. And when I went in there and I was attending events, um, I'm sure some of you guys have encountered this, and I'm sorry for the men, but. Um, you know, it was almost like a little bit of a boys club, <laughs> you know, and sometimes there was a little struggle there with the women and the Latinas doing their thing. And then I said, you know what, I'm just going to go build my own little club, you know. And so I started doing that and I started looking for other like-minded Latinas and mm -hmm. I actually created 
my first, you know, inner circle, uh, which I guess, you know, is also known as mastermind groups. And um, it's interesting um, how much this particular group, how we've all grown and it's been such a huge support system to each other. Because first of all, as a woman, sometimes, you know, I can't go home to my boyfriend and say, oh, I want to go after this guy, I'm going to take his business away, I'm going to do all this. And he's like, Lati, go call one of your girlfriends. <laughs> you know, I mean, this cutthroat way or whatever my ideas are, the challenges, the successes, I don't want to bring it home. And one of the things that I did with my circle is we also all had to sign a confidentiality so that we, were, we felt protected there that we could share. Um, but besides that inner circle, I do events where I bring other women in, whether it's Hispanic or not, and we just share and we just talk. Um, it's not, again, anything to knock the men. It's just that what I've seen is over the years, women haven't really shared as much and been open. Um, I hate to say it, but sometimes you got the queen bee out there that it's all about this attack and you know being the best. I'm about sharing it forward and then how can we grow together? So that's what I do. I like it. Wonderful. That's why you're successful. <laughs> uh, next question, oh, please. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, wait. It's okay. It's okay. No, no, no. I, I want to let, hear. Let, I'd rather well, hear. No, no, I'd rather go. Hear. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, my question Sorry, is for um, Ms. Maria Wayne. Um, speaking earlier, um, you mentioned like the way that you, uh, the process you went through in order to get to your um, leadership role. And I found that like you were exposed to many opportunities, which is great. However, nowadays, like you said, 33% of Hispanic uh, girl, uh, girls are under the poverty line or on the poverty line, and are and either because their parents are not educated enough to um, inform them about the resource out there, they cannot reach full potential. Uh, what do you think is the best way to educate these parents in order for their daughters or sons to get to the top? That's a really good question. Yes, it is. Um, one of the, the one in in the in the experience that I've had in the Girl Scouts, one of the things that we um, began to do about five years ago was to really focus on the Hispanic communities. And part of it was because um, in the Hispanic communities, Girl Scouting was not understood as um, something that would benefit a child. The fact that we called you know Girl Scout groups troops, or yeah. you know they would be thought of as, as tropas, and so helping parents to understand that these were not militaristic organizations, you know, that were, that were out to recruit children and brainwash them or whatever, was uh, really important. So I think when we look at parents, and, and I just had a, a, an interview with Oi where they asked me this, a similar question. And I think there's a couple of things. One, we need to help, um, we need to raise the, the importance in our communities of how important um, Parental, parental engagement is. It's so important for that parent to be engaged. And the messages need to come across from all kinds of different points, uh, faith-based organizations, from the community leaders, and from, from schools as well. Schools should have an expectation of the engagement of, of the parent. I know it's hard to do. Um, in areas of, um, in underserved areas with the Girl Scouts, for example, we have a difficult time getting volunteers. So we send staff in to begin the, the programming for girls so that we can help the community understand the importance of the investment in girls, of investing in our youth. And I'm not sure that we're talking enough about the importance of being an engaged parent or an engaged um, volunteer at the community level to change the lives of of kids as they're growing up. I think that's something that we all need to do a much better job of. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Artemio Arreola. I'm the political director at NICER. And uh, um, from your last comment in the, in the big room, is, uh, 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 La Iris Martinez, the first senator and the, la and the only one we have right in the house. And then I have thinking on this, on the Chicago, not single alderman women is in the in the in the in the in the, in the, in the council, but also thinking in a, we we do have how many seven or eight aldermans out of the fifty, and we are at thirty percent of the population in Chicago. And I was uh, and I maybe Jesse, you know how really we we you know we had to you know be in there and be really a uh, leadership and empowerment our community, and, uh, uh, and this is a lot of luck. Of, and this is only an example, you know, it's in Chicago. 
30% of the population are Latinos. Only we have seven seats out of the 50, and not single women in there. And we cannot talk every single city on the state level, but it's, a, it's, it's and you know, to have, it's, it's big challenge in the front of us. Our community is growing up. What is our really change to the future? You know, prepare for the next census. Really to count our people. What is the next strategy for the redistricting? Get us the really redistricting. You know, we have only one Congress district, Latino Congress. You know, and in other Congress, our population is so high, and sometimes the elected officials not stand up in our issues. Uh, we really have point of uh, really thinking. All those growing up children in the United States, what is our future? And uh, you know, I think Jesse is in a good positions to educate and empowerment and, and examples of you guys can really, uh, you know, motivarnos, you know, but it, it's more to think about it, right? Thank you. Thank you, Artemio. My name is Hilda Frontani. Um, I, I, I look at you all up there and everyone that I've encountered that has opened the doors for our Latino community. And one of the things that I've admired is that most of the individuals that have opened the doors for the rest of us were fully bilingual, knew their culture, and were proud of that culture and shared it with all of us. Um, I, I too make the comment that uh, uh, Ariola made. In the city council, we don't have that much representation, but also, I think, Jesse, you would agree with me that you would encourage our young Latino population to go to law school, because if we look at the judiciary in, in, in Chicago, in the state of Illinois, we're not building the bridges so that we have more Sonia Sotomayors. Right in this room, I think we have a couple of women who are running for judges. My hats go off to all of you. Thank you for opening the doors. Now, in terms of learning the language and, and being fully bilingual. Has that helped all of you in terms of reaffirming your leadership? Absolutely, absolutely. I think if there is one thing I always raise with young people is learn languages, not just one more, learn languages. It's a bit of a, an embarrassment with a lot of my colleagues at the Organization of American States. They speak the four languages of the region. Uh, in addition to, to English and Spanish, French and Portuguese. Um, and they're very comfortable moving in between the languages. And um, it's, it's just such an advantage to be able to communicate with somebody in their own language. Um, I never, I, and to this day, you know, I'm grateful to my late mother that they insisted that we learn Spanish. I know that, you know, uh, there were eras here when speaking Spanish was a detriment. There are places still when people get punished for speaking Spanish. But I would encourage all you, you young people here, learn languages. This is a global environment that we are working in and living in. It is no, no longer, you can go to the panaderia and order your pan dulce. It's doing what Jesse does, which is ne negotiate uh, mergers and acquisitions. It's what Leti does in her business. I mean, and, and of course, Maria, learn languages because if you are going to succeed in a global environment, which is now, you need to know more than one language. Thank you. Jesse, can you take care of that since you're with CPS? Put it, we need more languages. Languages <laughs> is important. Um, and, uh, you know, the legal profession has changed a lot. So uh, I don't know if I'd invite my sons. I tell you, maybe become a hedge fund manager instead. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> given, uh, given the, uh, you know, just given the, C the, frankly, you look at the the, the very wealthy Chicagoans in town. Uh, you know, in terms of the most wealthy, the Forbes list and the Chicagoans who are there, there are no Latinos. Um, you know, I don't say I don't. You know, it, frankly, wealth is not the most important factor in my life. I want to provide for my family. I want to be secure in my old age, but. You know, I, I don't necessarily I'd never aspire to become a billionaire, but frankly, some of those billionaires are impacting public education policy in Chicago quite a, quite a great deal. Uh, Bill Gates is is impacting public education policy across this nation quite a big deal. Uh, the Walton Found Family Foundation is impacting public education. So uh, Mike Bloomberg. I mean, so you look and see economic empowerment sometimes also influences public policy and political empowerment. 
Um, so we can't forget about economic empowerment uh, as well. I mean, we've got to, like, frankly, be engaged in all sectors, the public, the private, legal arena, as well as the business arena, um, and, and, you know, frankly, make an impact in all of those and then form those coalitions to address some of the issues impacting our community. Um, but yeah, education is key. Whatever, whatever educational endeavor it is that you do, and frankly, I think graduate education is going to become a greater and greater factor for all of us, whether it be a master's, an MBA, doctoral degrees, MDs, JDs, uh, PhDs. I think that's going to be a critical factor to our success. Um, and uh, uh, you know, one thing you mentioned, and I just want to not lose the opportunity. Diana, can you stand up? The folks who are running for judge, so at least we can do something about. Yay. Give us your give us your name, really loud. What area? So Yay. speaking of leadership, so, we can do something right here and help get Diana elected. Last point that frustrates me at times is that, yeah, there's two Latinos on the school board out of seven. Uh, Latinos are now not the majority, but we are the plurality at 43% of the 400,000 roughly CPS students. We're not 43% of the school board, and I've told Barbara this a number. I love Barbara Bird Bennett, but she's got to have more senior Latinos on her staff. They don't exist. She's half, a lot of folks don't know. She's, her mother's Puerto Rican. She's Latina. Um, but that's great that she's, you know, half Puerto Rican, but I don't see them on her senior staff, and we got to have that. You know, frankly, I'm, I'm disappointed we're going to have her here today. Cook County Board President Preckwinkle, where are the Latinos on your senior staff? Uh, so, uh, and our aldermen, so we got to get on our county commissioners just so like everybody's got to get on me so I can tell Barbara, it's not me telling you this, it's everybody in this room telling that's, you know, I'm just the, I'm just the messenger, but that message has got a bit sent. Thank you, Jesse. And, and Diana Rosario, I just have to say, Diana's a wonderful person. I just want to say I used to work with her. I used to work before uh, being a legislator. I worked for the Cook County State's Attorney's Office 18 years. and. I worked with her. I was a supervisor over the department that she was working for. Thank you, Diana. Okay, last question, please. Um, I was I was going to go back to a question that was asked previously, as far as uh, resources for uh, for young Latinos that probably do not have them. I was going to ask what resources are available at this time, not only to make young Latinos aware of what what they can achieve and how they can achieve it, but also to instill in them. I guess a sense of hope and a sense of leadership in order to do so. The reason I ask that is because I try to run a community-based program. The only support I have found for it right now is through my local church. I try to get um, like gangbangers off the streets, uh, dropouts, single moms, stuff like that, try to get them back into school, try to get them to know what their options are. However, I work with CPS as well, and I know there's a lack of support there and the only su support or the only structure that I have been able to find is through a program, a Young Marines program. I strongly endorse that, strongly endorse the military with them, and so far that's the only thing that's helping. But I was gonna ask what other resources, what other programs I can use or other people can use to bring up other Latinos that are maybe not as fortunate as a lot of people in, in this room. Can I jump in? <laughs> Real quick. You're standing next to someone who I think is great, Adrian Soto from the 18th Street Development. And um, Adrian, um, I connected him recently with someone who was young, starting a nonprofit, um, so that he could kind of like mentor culture a little on what she was trying to do for youth and scholarships and whatnot. So you never know if there's a local chamber or if you meet some small business owners. I spoke a couple of days ago in um, Woodstock to uh, eighth gr a senior uh, group of kids, and they were all Latinos, on how can they uh, achieve things in her life and not think about the constraints of financial struggles. And one of the girls, the first question I was asked to me was, do you have a scholarship program? And it was funny because I was standing there like, oh, oh, I don't, right? But she put it in my head and now I'm trying to think about how can I create one and it's going to start with that school. And I sent out a text about it this morning. 
The other thing I want to mention is uh, Judy Bartopinko's office, uh, through a gentleman named Chuck Hagopian, which is her right-hand man, has a scholarship program that they just announced, I think, in August to give X amount of scholarships for X schools. And I think uh, City Colleges is a part of it uh, for about four years. So that's someone, if you want afterwards, see me, and then I'll connect you to him. But there are programs, but exactly what you just did, just keep talking it and start asking people, ask business people, and you'll be surprised it will start coming out. I was going to say, uh, thank you for the information. Um, I was going to say, when the one of the main things I was going to ask for is that not so much the lack of money, even though that is a big part of it, but I guess you could say the lack of hope and also the, like a lot of students, they'll see and I'll show them opportunities, I'll show them what they can do to get back into school, to bring up test scores, that sort of thing. But a lot of them come with the mentality that they're not going to make it or they don't have that high of expectations. So I guess I would say, and the reason I brought up the Young Marines program is because that gives you discipline, but it also gives you what's the word, uh, self-confidence. Yeah. And a lot of these people do not have that. And that's what I say, if there's other programs, because a lot of parents do not agree with the military. Yeah. And though I highly promote it, a lot of the parents are starting to hate my program because of it. <laughs> so well, I was gonna say, if the there's other programs, home. I'm sorry. They don't want the kids to leave home. My son just left last year and he's in the Air Force. Yes. But you know what, if you find some inspirational speakers to come in, I mean, I do that, mm -hmm. because we were low income. We were the first minority family in the Austin area. And we, my brothers got abused physically. I mean, we went through so much, but so what? That's everybody's story. It's putting the back the good stories to say, I can do this. Yes. So what if I didn't have, we were low income, so what? Look at me now, right? Mm -hmm. And I totally believe that we can all achieve what we want. So you just gotta bring people that are there and then just start bringing them in and introducing them and have them talk to your groups. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. If there's other, other programs or people I could talk to, to I guess you could say, yeah, to inspire these people and all that. And I understand about the military because my parents were actually um, disowned me in a way at 18 when, when I left for the military. Well, thank you very so, much. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Yes. How many veterans do we have here? Raise your hand. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for representing my state. Thank you. OK, we're done? Okay, uh, we're just going to wait for Maria and then we're going to wrap it up. I want to make sure that she gets a message. Can I just ask uh, what church you're working with? Oh, thank you. Okay. Oh, wonderful. So if there's some non for profits there, it would be good to ask him if you can partner up with them. Blanca. Yeah, we have Blanca, Blanca here too. <laughs> Blanca, we need you to speak to this gentleman. Thank you. We're almost done. Don't leave. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna start wrapping it up. Uh, I just wanna thank my panelists here today and thank the audience for being here and thank you for your continued support with the Illinois Legislative Latino Caucus Foundation. Um, I want to also um, give an award to our panelists, our matter. So um, I'm gonna start with Jesse Ruiz. Jesse? Thank you. Thank you for all your support. Thank you. Not only for the conference, but for the Latino Caucus. And everyone in the state of Illinois. Maybe you want to show me? That's very nice. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Again, thank you, Jesse. Louder, louder. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next, Maria. Yay, Maria. Thank you again, Maria, for everything you do. We are so proud to have a Latina as the CEO of the Girl Scouts of America. Go girls! <laughs> okay, Carmen, you're next. <laughs> Yay, Carmen, thank you for all you do. We are so proud. Thank you very much. Another woman, we're so proud of her. Go girls! <laughs> and boys and guys. <laughs> And Leticia, our businesswoman. Thank you, Leticia. Thank you.
What an inspiration. Everyone, all the panelists, thank you for all you do. Thank you. We can't thank you enough for being here today, but we are so proud of you. Always know that. Thank you.